Welcome, everybody. I'm here today with Stephen Messer. Uh, I'm very excited to have Stephen in the context of what we normally talk about, which is digital value creation. One reason is a lot of times digital technologies are primarily used for efficiencies, cost efficiencies, cost reduction, streamlining cost. And one of the most exciting things about value creation, and definitely in the context of private equity, is top line growth, sales, marketing. I couldn't think of a better person uh, than Stephen, who practically was part of the fabric of the internet by originally inventing uh, affiliate marketing at Linkshare back in the day when he was Entrepreneur of the Year at Ernst & Young and uh, since then had been a serial entrepreneur, angel investor, and uh, lecturer at various business schools. So Stephen, welcome. Thank you for having me. So I figured to start it off, why don't you say a couple of things about yourself? I work with my sister and uh, my brother-in-law, which might seem strange, um, uh, except for we come from an entrepreneurial family. So our whole lives have been spent trying to reimagine and disrupt the way businesses historically operated and to find ways to really create value in, uh, in, in a manner that may not have been possible before technology advancements. Almost always we work in a network-based environment because we find networks provide a, a multiplier effect uh, in terms of a value that you can create around technology. And we'll talk a little bit more about that today as we dig in deeper. But networks always have this amazing exponential growth capability. And we find that that is really, of course, in the end of the day, the most disruptive thing. Why don't we start up with something that's most recent in everybody's mind? So uh, we are all in uh, navigating different aspects of digital technologies. So for the meaning of this podcast, I just call it digital, as bad as that general term is. So through the crisis, what are the kinds of things, trends or acrobatics that you noticed that uh, may have been surprising for you or maybe it was something you expected to happen? So uh, historically, part of our, the mission of Collective Eye is to optimize the globe's economy from a B2B perspective. And so we always saw our mission as to eliminate or mitigate um, these uh, economic disruptions, um, whether that be a, a, a recession, depression, et cetera. And what I'll say that was the most exciting thing to find from both the data that we see as well as the business was was actually maybe some of these dislocations, as horrible as they are, are critical. Um, it seems when you look that the 12 Goldilocks years that we had had actually stifled innovation quite a lot. Kai-Fu Lee used to talk about how China had surpassed um, uh, the United States in its adoption of use and amongst its general population of technologies that use AI. And in the last three months of, uh, of COVID, what you've seen is this huge adoption and a mass acceptance of technology in a way you've never seen before. Um, this sort of concept of uh, never let a good um, uh, crisis go to waste has really been a major advancement in the adoption of AI technology in general, um, but also new approaches to business that would have been unheard of even uh, six months ago. I mean, you you currently work with a lot of companies that are more in a business-to-business kind of uh, uh, sales uh, environment. Did you see major shifts in terms of how people interacted with your network, how they sold uh from company to company, I, I anticipate some of the, uh, you noticed some of the reduction in activity, but what are the kinds of things specifically that you noticed? The first thing was a massive rush to automation. Uh, we, we have a product called Intelligent Writeback, um, and we automate uh, the traditional sales forecast to make sure that people get a daily forecast. Those to a lot of uh, traditional companies and PE firms um, had historically thought the way they were doing it was about workflow and it would be just fine. I, I always felt like the first victim of COVID was this idea of this manual opinion-based forecasting process because people realized uh, maybe it was, a it was because COVID really hit in the last two weeks of a quarter, um, but people realized instantly that that opinion-based forecast was literally just a guess and, um, and you can't operate a business, you can't uh, make business decisions when the entire revenue predictions of your company are based entirely on how people feel at a given day and a given moment, especially when they only can understand a very small portion of the world. So we saw that go automatically um, change. The second thing we saw was 
there was a, a belief that um, the harder you work, the, the better it was. So salespeople were supposed to log every activity. They were supposed to log all these things. And of course, salespeople never historically did that. But automation was no longer seen as a replacement because salespeople were lazy or whatever they wanted to call them. Actually, quite the opposite. People started thinking about efficiency, where they spend their time, how they work. So it was amazing to see how quickly the logic changed from these legacy way of thinking to a, a technology AI first approach for our customers. But the speed was was un, unparalleled. It's interesting you say something about speed. So I noticed that obviously in my in my day job, but also as I talk to uh, investors, there were two interesting learnings. One from every corner of the world. I mean, there was a massive acceleration in in uh, digital technology adoption, and of course the vendors looked at it saying, "Yay, that's great." But the reason it happened, as we all know, is, is the workforce went home and they're just the constraint was put out innovation. And many people believe innovation constrained actually gets better. Uh, but the second thing that I thought was a corollary to that is, is the executive teams realized that these kinds of transformations or, or technology deployment shouldn't take that long. I mean, one of the interesting conversations I had just last week was maybe um, we should compress the time we assume these kinds of digital transformations, whether it's top line related or, or efficiency based, should take. Uh, are, you, are you seeing the similar trends uh, that, that companies rethink how, how, how they should respond to the urgency in, in sales and marketing where you operate? Yeah, I think you bring up a really important point. I think what everyone learned first and foremost was there was a huge gap between digital first companies and uh, everybody else. And so what you saw was, you know, sure, we may have been used to using an old version of Exchange and it's fine and it's great. But all of a sudden, when, when everyone else was working from home, some companies ad adapted the day they went home and everything worked fine and other companies blew up. Uh, they didn't have enough VPN connections. Everything started breaking. The support team fell apart. And it wasn't simply about could we operate? It was we are operating poorly doing just the basics. So you saw a rapid compression in decisioning. I think what, what they also learned was this idea that a digital transformation can happen in an evolutionary way is a much more painful approach. The, this, the, the sort of this disruption or um, uh, seismic change of having everyone go to video conferencing in one day helped people learn that within by the end of the week, everyone was operating perfectly well. Everyone was very comfortable with it. And yes, maybe some people still forgot that their mic was on and when it was off, but these were minor changes and the organization was able to very quickly adopt. And it does fit that when you look at the same person who's, who struggles in a company to adopt a new technology, and then you look at them when they go into their consumer life and how fast they adopt new apps, it's the same human being. The question is whether the organization as a whole is willing to quickly adopt in the way they would if they were an individual. And I think what we've learned is actually that is the much more efficient way. It's much easier for the user base to make a rapid adoption than these slow rollouts that have historically gone on. And I think I, I, I doubt they'll go back. I don't think we'll go back to these nine month decision processes, slow rollouts, picking small groups. I think you're going to see much more of a revolutionary approach in technology. You operate in the AI machine learning enabled sales space which uh, for many, it's believed that sales will be the last part of a business that will be automated. That's sort of immune to automation because it's an art, not just a science. Whereas marketing has, has been quite automated in many ways from ad marketplaces to just the way uh, commerce works. So do you think there's a shift now of a larger percentage of the actual uh, sales interaction, especially business to business, being automated? It has to be. Uh, look, you have a, a customer who's expecting answers immediately. They've been trained for 20 years on Amazon in their personal lives. As you see across pat rapidly growing technology sector in the B2B space, you're seeing more and more automation to allow people to make decisions to get a product up and operating, use it and decide if they want to buy it right away. And everything is about shortening that cycle. It has to become automated. 
Now, that doesn't mean the value of the sales professional goes down. Quite the opposite. You actually are focusing them on the things that are the most valuable things they could do. And in fact, if you think about this, the sales team is the most expensive and most valuable team you have. You not only, they're, they're frankly the only team that has an opportunity cost in the entire organization. So they're always going to be the most valuable. Yet we've historically had a situation where the organization of sales is willing to give up a day to do things like forecasting or willing to give a day up to have people manually log what they did throughout the day. These are in, insane, costly, expensive things to do that, frankly, people are bad at and hate to do. But yet it was expected to be part of the job as if it was some rite of passage. So I think what you're starting to see is that science really permeates everything. I remember starting LinkShare when the marketer would say it's all an art, not a science. And today, those people are consultants who are no longer CMOs, because what you found is that the digital marketing players were able to actually figure out the science of using uh, different technologies to have a dialogue with their customer that's more meaningful. And I think sales will move that way as well, where the value that each seller will deliver will be much higher, but the low value tasks that can be automated to make the buyer's experience better will be done by an AI um, like Collective Eye or other types of technologies. Uh, one of the conversations comes up quite a bit is we have the digital native generation, whether it's uh, the tail end of millennials and definitely the Gen Z. Uh, you have your, through your network, you have immense visibility into how salespeople actually perform their roles. Do you actually see differences between, and I don't know how much you can tell, between how a, a digital native person operates uh, through your through their sales cycles and customer interactions versus uh, somebody who who sort of grew up with the traditional tools or without them. So I, I don't want to, I don't want to use a digital native versus because I feel like that that makes it as if it's a generational thing. I think there's a growth mindset. What you'll find inside of every organization and has almost nothing to do with the generation. What you'll almost always find is that there are people who say this can't happen. It won't work. And the lack of growth mindset around the ability to recognize that technology is constantly taking on more challenges and helping alleviate it, and each time it has, it's made our life better, is essentially the difference between success and failure. If you are someone who's done something the way you did it the last year, two, three, five, 10, or 15 years ago, you are at risk of falling behind because you believe that you figured something out. The reality is the world is constantly changing. We're influenced by the, the technological changes that affect our day-to-day -day life. We're influenced by the world globally, COVID being a great example. So what, what we know is that every year it should change or improve rapidly. Five years ago, Tesla was, was struggling to get its car company out. Today, they expect this year to end where a full self-driving uh, car will, will take over and be operational. That's five years. In sales, it's no different. Um, our customers, even if I were in, in, in a traditional manufacturing business, five years ago, I was probably uh, making a, a dumb product. Today, it's an IoT product. Um, you know, my pump used to have to pump a certain amount of water. Today, I have to have a digital twin of that pump. These are all things that are going to rapidly change. So rather than take the approach of saying um, uh, it won't happen, the leaders that we see with a growth mindset say, how can I leverage this to get an advantage in the market in the time I have before everybody else gets it? And I think that's the bigger challenge we see. Now, I will say digital native people are just always looking for a new technology to make their lives easier. And so you do find people with a growth mindset that are more digitally native because their assumption is the AI should be doing this. Whereas we find people without that saying, um, no one can do it like I can. And it's a, I think it's, it's part and parcel of what the TV has told them of worrying about their job. There's nothing to worry about their job. It's actually removing the things that they hate to do and makes them just better for their clients. Uh, absolutely. So, so you briefly touched on various technologies like IoT and digital twins. So, so let me, let me uh, ask a question to your other role, which is as an investor and an angel investor and entrepreneur that's probably looking for what's the edge out there beyond uh, the company you're running. Uh, what are the kinds of technologies or trends uh, that you get excited about as you, as you look outside of your uh, four walls? So, so look, the, there, there are a few things that we look at as an investor, and, and some of this is just general technology trends of things that we find really interesting, and some of them are from an economic perspective. So I'll start with the general business trends. We are obsessed uh, with quantum. 
Um, quantum computing is, is uh, unbelievably obsessive. One, because it's linear algebra and it's using things like Python, which are already out there. So there is a large user base that can take advantage of quantum computing when it becomes available, probably through a cloud with the existing skill set that they already have, which means you're going to have a very rapid adoption from a limited number of players who can actually build a quantum infrastructure, whether that be quantum communication, which is something completely different, whether that be about the change that will take place when encryption is no longer RSA, um, or whether it be new types of problems that we couldn't have solved. But as an AI guy, we look at quantum in a, a near obsessive way because we believe that that will um, spread very quickly and help us solve a new set of problems. So I think from tool sets to infrastructure, um, there is a just a, a ton of opportunities there. Most people believe that it, that will happen in the next 10 or 15 years. The reality is it'll probably happen within three to five years. Quantum communication already in existence, quantum sensing already in existence and growing quite quickly. So we see that from a, a category that we really like. From an economic perspective, we almost always obsess over networks and we obsess over marketplaces. And this is more uh, taking advantage of the fact that venture capitalists have historically had a very hard time understanding, valuing, and investing in these sectors. So what typically happens in both networks and marketplaces are for a certain number of years, it looks like almost nothing is taking place. In fact, uh, three years in, if you looked at Airbnb, you would have thought this company is a dud. It will never make it and it will never take off. But of course, what's happening is you're getting past chicken and egg in small steps. And at one point you reach this inflection point where it takes off. What that means is that over the three years they need to raise money, you have the ability to build out um, uh, an, an, uh, an investment portion that's undervalued. And then when it turns into value, it almost becomes overvalued because of the acceleration. Finally, it also gets a, lock at mar a, a market lock-in. So an example of that would be we were the first investors in a company called Spire. Spire is a satellite company. It's one of my favorites. I sit on the board of it. Uh, but what's interesting about it is it, the, the business was not able to produce revenue until it had global coverage of these cube satellites, which meant we had to have over 100 plus satellites in orbit for us to begin to operate. So you had to fund the business to put satellites in orbit that would fall to earth every three years while you were launching a lot of satellites. So it was a high cap X industry. Now that we're um, uh, live, all of a sudden the companies went from almost no revenue to massive revenue because we're able to provide things that could never have happened before. So the investors who were able to who get in early got an unbelievable return. The investors now who want to invest are paying the premium of, of, of having missed that opportunity. So that's an example of where we like it. Collective Eye being the exact same story. We're a network business where in the beginning we had to convince companies to join our network. Today we have the largest history of buying and selling data across every industry that's given us a market advantage in, in uh, being able to do better predictions and things like that. So those are the examples that we like on those side. Yeah, I like them. And one of the questions that uh, uh, I usually ask people is uh, which of these technologies do they think is hype versus not hype or not hyped enough? And and it's funny because you mentioned quantum computing and I heard people put quantum computing as an imminent opportunity versus uh, a pipe dream. Uh, but when you look at technologies out there, what are the areas that, that you're not excited because you think it's overhyped? Is there such a category? I think today, virtual reality, obviously, you've seen what's going on with Magic Leap and some of the other players there, uh, even Palmer Lucky, who started, um, you know, uh, Oculus, which was acquired by Facebook, has moved on. It's not that it's not valuable. I, I think there are just a lot of challenges around that. Augmented reality is more likely to be successful because there's business uses. Um, uh, one of the biggest ones, unfortunately, though, is the lack of being able to use facial recognition. I do think that's not necessarily a good thing, the way uh, Europe and America have responded to facial recognition, which could actually do quite a lot to improve uh, safety um, and quite a lot to do improve, improve against fraud. Um, it's a tool. Um, tools are good and bad. Um, unfortunately, it's gotten uh, uh, shellacked with the bad brush. Um, I always try to explain that all tools can do good and bad things. Um, a scalpel can kill someone and save someone at the same time. It's a tool. The user is um, uh, the thing that you have to provide laws against. So while we do absolutely need to protect against some of the negative uses, um, it would be amazingly valuable to be able to have a security guard know that at a, you know, at a nuclear facility that this person actually is the person they claim to be. 
um, and things like that. So I think in the meantime, virtual reality, I think, will go on being a, a bit of a fringe, um, but it will, it will probably grow. AR will probably get a big boost if Apple does release a product. They tend to do release um, a, a very user-friendly version of it. And I think that's probably more likely to come than VR. I happen to be um, a fan of augmented reality in, in one area because I saw that used extensively in factories and semiconductors and elsewhere. But I agree with you. There's a lot of things around VR that it's unclear in terms of applications. So, Stephen, as a final question, one of the things I thought about is you have a very unique perspective, uh, you know, from looking at things from an entrepreneurial side, from running a business and talking to um uh, executives, and also being an executive yourself, running a business and growing it. So as we revert back to selling and, and improving the sales process, if you sat down with a CEO today, how would you talk to them about AI and machine learning in the context of enterprise selling? What, what is it you think they should think about, both in terms of short-term capability, but also long-term priorities? Look, I think sales has historically gotten a free pass because everyone's been afraid to shake the tree. Historically, sales uh, leadership controls all the information about what's going on with their customers. They control the story about what they're hearing from the market, and they control where the revenue they believe will come from. And what that what that's done is made sales a very powerful player. It's part of the the, the downside that sales is encountering now, which is they haven't innovated. Um, they're now feeling innovation being pushed or thrust upon them. Things like outreach, um, uh, sales loft, yesware, um, all these technologies came from the end user, not the leadership. And so what's happening is just like the marketers 20 years ago, a lot of the technology is driving them to change as opposed to their adopting or getting hold of the change. The reason why I bring that up is if you don't control the revenue you can't optimize the business, whether it be all the way down to supply chain of what, what material is needed in what factory, what, what, what uh, warehouse should have what material so they can ship. All of these things start from a very predictable process of sales where you can understand what customers are looking to buy, what products far in advance of when they need to be in the warehouse. But yet that hasn't been able to be predictable because sales professionals haven't provided a clear view into what's going on. What AI does for everybody is help the organization to become very buyer centric. We call it a collective eye, the Amazonification of B2B. How do you make sure that you can do things like deliver a product that used to take two weeks in a day? Well, you do that by doing, you know, predictive And you do that by doing things that are anticipatory shipping. Like we expect in a flow business that you'll be buying these products. So we have it already at a warehouse that's closest to you because we assume that you'll need it. And we can cut down on the shipping cost by making sure it's there. These are examples where you can drive through sales with AI, mostly with collective eye. You can really transform the economics of a business, but that also makes it easier to transform an entire industry. Remember, people forget it was one click shopping that decimated Toys R Us. It wasn't all of Amazon's prime, everything else. Each additional area that they were able to roll out because Amazon had better data enabled them to do something that caused their competitor to no longer be competitive. And I think that's a big benefit of, of where we spend our time. In fact, we spend almost all of our time using AI to analyze where can we find efficiencies and optimizations. I think it's why PE firms love us so much, which is we give transparency, visibility, but more importantly, we give them the levers they can pull to completely change the economics of their business and to do without having to gut the way the sales organization operates. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for for those that are PE listeners in this in this video series, clearly uh, there's an impact on the top line, but also on working capital. One of the things I like about it is the is uh, how this kind of predictability helps with the inventory levels and inventory turns, and therefore working capital and cash flow. So so that could be the green eye shade angle of of what you're talking about. Exactly. Uh, so, Stephen, uh, thank you so much for joining us. There's so much to do, and and uh, I'm definitely going to be a listener to to uh, the pod, uh, the video podcast you guys are putting out. It's very exciting, and I think the general topic about B2B sales growth, I think uh, a lot of uh, my clients are thinking about because the only the only way out of this pandemic is actually in sales growth and, and expansion. 
So excited to have you. I'm, I'm glad we got your perspective and looking forward to reconnecting soon. Thank you for having me here. You know, your podcasts are always one of my favorites. I listen to all of them. I think anyone who doesn't take the time to listen to it is missing out on an opportunity to grow. So thank you for having me here. And, um, uh, and thank you again for your time.